pues eh, buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, gracias por, por estar aquí hoy. Eh, bueno, eh, la mesa redonda que vamos a hacer eh, hoy aquí, vamos a hablar sobre el enfortalecimiento eh, comunitario y el objetivo de, de la mesa pues era un poco con los invitados eh, y la invitada que tenemos hablar sobre eh, las, las, las limitaciones ¿no? y las oportunidades eh, que presenta este enfortecimiento de la comunidad eh, sobre todo desde esta perspectiva más de la experiencia ¿no? que ellos nos, nos aportarán eh, para reflexionar sobre este tema tenemos aquí eh, tres personas en, a mi derecha, en primer lugar, ten, tenemos a Rebeca Kemble, que es trabajadora y propietaria de la Union Cup Cooperative of Medicine de Wisconsin, Estados Unidos, y que desde el año 2015 ella es, eh, forma parte del pleno del Ayuntamiento de, de Madison. Buenos días. En segundo lugar, eh, tenemos a Richard Redifison, que es director de desarrollo de capacidades del Fondo de Desarrollo Local de Madagascar. Él es una persona que es un, eh, hace más de 10 años que se dedica pues, al asesoramiento eh, de municipios en tema de presupuestos participativos y tiene pues, gran experiencia en este, en este ámbito. Y finalmente con nosotros tenemos a José Manuel Ribeiro, es alcalde de Valongo, de Portugal. Entonces, eh, ¿cómo nos organizaremos? Hablaremos en primer lugar cada uno de nuestros invitados durante 10-12 minutos y al final eh, abriremos un torno de debate y, y, y un torno abierto de, de preguntas. Entonces, pues sin más, empezamos con Rebeca. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to speak in English. I hope that's okay. And as I was introduced, uh, I was introduced first as a taxi driver and a member of Union Cab uh, Taxi Cooperative um, because that's how I really got my start in participatory politics, participatory economics, and it was through uh, 15 years of experience in direct participatory economic activity in my cooperative and in cooperative networks um, around the world that So I, I actually gave up a, an academic career. I was studying the shift from formal colonialism to neocolonialism in Kenya during the 1950s. And um, through a series of events, uh, I moved back from Kenya to my home and uh, was looking for a short-term job. And I had always secretly wanted to be a taxi driver. And so I thought I would get just a summer job at a taxi company to drive taxi. Uh, to support my family. I had three children. And um, I went and I got that job and I found out it was a worker cooperative, which I had known nothing about. I didn't know about cooperatives at all. But here was a business with 200 workers who democratically owned and managed a transportation company that was a vital element of my city's uh, public transportation network. And within one month of working there, I was being asked to make decisions about this $6 million dollar company um, without having had any business school, without having had any training in, in how to make these decisions, together with 200 other people from varying levels of education, uh, making very serious business decisions. And it just it impressed me so much that we were through consultation, through dialogue, through argumentation and debate, we were able to make better decisions than had we had one general manager telling us what to do. Um, and so from there, uh, for three years, I worked both as a, a cab driver and also in academia because I just love the driving taxi and I also love the worker cooperative movement. But finally, I left the uh, academic career in order to seriously pursue building worker cooperatives as a way to, um, to, to deal with the economic, ecological, and social crises that were so um, devastating our world. This was in 2003. 
when my country was pursuing, just beginning to pursue wars uh, in the Middle East. And I thought, I have to do something practical to support people's capacity to collectively uh, protect their land and water, to defend democratic rights that we already have, and to nurture the capacity of people to collectively decide how to organize themselves to do those things. So as Amelia uh, was talking this morning, asking the question, how do we want to live? How do we want to work? How do we want to produce and consume? These are the questions that worker cooperative businesses and cooperatives network together, decide democratically, and decide based on values. Um, on cooperative values, democratic values, humane values. So um, cooperative decisions um, have much better and sustainable outcomes. Uh, when people understand the, the, their individual and collective stake in outcomes, they're going to participate more. So I think this question of how do we get more people to, to participate, give them more stake in the outcomes. They'll, they'll naturally participate. Um, and because of the primary purpose of cooperative enterprise is based on identifying and meeting the needs of people in society rather than on the imperative to extract profit, the commons are constituent of, not external to the, the decision-making process. So there's intrinsically in cooperative decision-making uh, a concern for the commons, a concern for the, for the common good. So in, in an increasingly unequal society driven by the profit motive, one person, one vote is not nearly enough to create justice and equity in communities. Democracy only works to create equity and justice when the group of people participating share values and agree on basic principles. And I think we need to have discussions about the importance of ideological clarity and political education, to be frank, um, when we're talking about democracy and voting and, and, and participation. And I just want to um, read something from He's not from Catalonia, he's from País Vasco, uh, but he's the spiritual father of, uh, with the worker cooperative movement, um, Father Jose Maria Ariz Mendiarrieta. And um, he says, knowledge is power, and in order to democratize power, one must socialize knowledge beforehand. We accomplish nothing with the proclamation of rights if afterwards, the people whose rights we have proclaimed are incapable of administering those rights, or if, to be able to act, these people have no recourse but to count on only a few indispensable members in the group. And so in cooperative endeavor, we really work to create the cooperator, the cooperative human being. Um, there's because the plans and the, uh, the endeavors that come out of cooperation are organically arise from the needs and the capacities of the people who form a part of that. And that's based on the needs of communities. So an opportunity came up for me a couple of years ago, in 2015, sorry, to um, leave directly working from the cooperative movement and to work in, in local politics when the mayor of my city announced a uh, $3 million investment in worker cooperative enterprises from the city. So I thought, I mean, by this time I was literally an international expert on worker cooperatives, and I thought, I can either complain about how they're doing it wrong, <laughs> or I could go get a seat at the table uh, and run for public office, which I did, and I won um, a seat, thanks to the, uh, the support of the movement. You know, we were talking, as Mayor uh, Kalau was talking this morning, she came up from the movements. I also came out of the movements and um, with a very specific purpose in mind, and that is to um, support this initiative. So I'll just go through a few slides. Sorry about this. To talk about this initiative. Um, so this is my city, how it looks. It's a city between two lakes. It's very beautiful. It's in the north. It's the capital city of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, there's about a quarter of a million people uh, in the city and half a million people in the region. 
Um, it's home to one of the largest public universities in the United States with about 40,000 undergraduate students and 10,000 graduate students. And it's very much known for its American football team, the Wisconsin Badgers. And so every weekend when there's a football game, like 100,000 people come into town and you know they love their Badgers and they love their Madison. But that and other things have driven a lot of gentrification and inequity. So it's been called the best place to live, but for whom? So it's the best place for bike-friendly people, for healthy, healthiest cities, best city for men, best college football town, one of the queerest cities in America, best for young adults, for young entrepreneurs. But um, as our National League of Cities has, which is a fairly conservative organization, has, has acknowledged that um, the drivers of growth, including new business startups, business expansions, property values, and retail sector health, starkly contrast with the reality of many residents on the lower rung of the economic ladder. Skills gaps, lack of affordable housing, and the rising demand for basic needs like food and shelter reveal that while economic conditions are improving for some, they're worsening for others. And those things are linked, as we know. Um, that the inequality is growing, basically, and there are certain people who are on the losing end. In my state of Wisconsin, those people are African Americans. We have the worst racial disparities in terms of quality of life indicators, incarceration, child well-being, child poverty of anywhere in the United States. Um, in 2013, a report came out documenting these very, very shocking statistics um, about black unemployment, black incarceration rates, um, black poverty rates. One of the most, the most awful statistic in here for me is that three quarters of black children uh, in, in 2011 lived in, below the poverty level compared to only 5.5% of white children. So think of 75% of our black residents' kids are poor. And it was just, this report was just such a scandal and such a shame, um, laying out how racist our city that's you know, so great for college football and all of these other things are. Um, additionally, um, the Latino Workers Project, which is a project that studied um, wage theft and working uh, environments for um, Latino workers, most of them immigrant workers, but some resident uh, workers. Their poverty rate, rate was double. Um, they, their income was half of that of the general population. They rank nas last nationally as a percentage covered by health insurance, which we're a terrible country for health insurance. We don't think, our national government doesn't think health, health care is a right, so we have to pay for it. 43% of them experience, experience wage theft. So in this, um, I'm just gonna flip through these. There's gentrification happening on the basis of tech companies in our town that are driving up um, housing costs that are gentrifying our town and that are also, um, um, pushing people out, out of the city um, because they can't afford to live there anymore. So given these, um, these forces, and these forces that you know, we know are actually global forces, um, but where they touch down in each of our localities, we have to deal with them. You know, I think that's what they were talking about this morning, about how we're all dealing with globalization, but those, oh, there's my timer. Um, those forces have to create reality somewhere, and those somewheres are our cities, those somewhere are our, you know, our um, countryside where mining and extractive industries happen. So th that, this is the site where reality happens. So this, just very quickly, this enterprise um, that the mayor was promoting came out of mass action. This was in 2011 where um, we occupied our capital for three weeks. It was during the time of the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Egypt, and we had a governor who was um, basically trying to outlaw unions, trying to attack uh, public education, public health, um, 
and people were mobilized. We had 200,000 people in the street in the winter, in the cold, to fight for worker rights. So there was a public um, consciousness raising around this. Cooperatives led, uh, led the sort of not only fight back but public education around how we can organize even when uh, organized labor is under attack and people were no longer able to have unions. How can we build solidarity economy? Um, this was our mayor and I'm, I'm just going to uh, show you a few of the cooperatives that already exist in Madison and then, then I'll, I'll wrap up real quick. So the idea is how do we do development, economic development for the people who already live here driven by the needs of the people who already live here, who um, care about um, each other, the land, the water, social services, et cetera. So we have more than, already more than 80 co-ops uh, in the city, but we need more to build a, to build a, um, to build a solidarity economy that is really meaningful, that can operate even you know, if another financial crisis comes and we have capital restrictions and whatever, if we have those relationships with, with each other based on solidarity and we know how to produce goods, we know how to produce services and we have that trust in each other as cooperative businesses, this is the idea behind expanding um, the, the cooperative network. So we have all kinds of different cooperatives. We have a worker cooperative in manufacturing, we have uh, um, social co-ops, we have retail co-ops, uh, credit unions, agricultural marketing co-ops, healthcare co-ops, uh, agricultural producer co-ops, housing co-ops. Uh, we have a cooperative um, research institute that is supportive and then a lobbying cooperative network. So I'll just leave you with um, the, the aims of this city program, which I fought really hard to um, convene community, the, the co-ops as well as uh, credit unions and community organizations that are on the front line serving these most marginalized people and the people who are excluded or exploited in the, um, in the labor movement, in the, in the um, exploited in the workplace, so that they are the people who are actually receiving the benefits of this project. So MCDC Madison Cooperative Development Coalition aims to move beyond traditional businesses and charitable models that attempt to tackle issues of inequity. The voices and needs of those most affected by systems of poverty and racism will be central to our mission. This will encompass communities of color, specifically African American, Latino, Native, and Southeast Asian communities. This will also encompass those experiencing homelessness, those formerly incarcerated queer and transgender communities. By uplifting and prioritizing the most marginalized of us, Madison beca can become a truly progressive and equitable city. And then I can answer technical questions about you know, the program, how it's working, how we developed the system um, later. Thank you, and I'm sorry Thank for you. taking so yeah. much time. Richard, please. Bonjour, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Donc, je vais continuer la présentation sur l'expérience de Madagascar en matière de renforcement de la communauté pour une réelle participation au développement local. Euh, la présentation va... Je vais vous parler d'abord de la contexte de la décentralisation à Madagascar et le paysage institutionnel d'une commune parce que l'expérience va se passer dans une commune euh, rurale. Et je vais vous parler un peu de la mission du Fonds de développement local où je travaille et les approches et expériences en renforcement de la communauté. Et un exemple concret de partenariat entre le Fonds de développement local et une commune rurale malgache. D'abord, euh, Madagascar, c'est un pays... Euh, dans, au milieu de l'océan Indien, 
où il y a de, en, environ 25 millions d'habitants et 590 milliards de carrés. Le pays a déjà commencé la décentralisation depuis l'année euh, 1990. Et ce n'est qu'en 2014 qu'il y a une, euh, un renouvellement de, de la loi sur la décentralisation. Et donc, euh, cette loi, cette nouvelle loi sur la décentralisation a, a mis en exergue donc, euh, euh, la, la manière participative et transparente de la gestion des collectivités locales. Et ça a été euh, allé jusqu'à la mise en place d'un nouveau décret pour la mise en place d'une structure locale de concertation au niveau d'une commune. Et il faut préciser que Madagascar a 22 régions et 1695 communes. Et vous voyez que ce n'est pas facile de, de transmettre le message, de, de, de mobiliser les communautés pour euh, prendre en, en main leur développement. Une commune à Madagascar, c est, c est, je pense que c'est à peu près comme toutes les communes, il y a le bureau exécutif et un conseil communal et à côté le représentant de l'État qui assure l'appui conseil et le contrôle de l'égalité. Mais avec la nouvelle loi sur la décentralisation, donc, il y a maintenant la structure locale de concertation au niveau d'une commune où les représentants de chaque entité, de chaque groupe socio-économique euh, euh, se représente dans cette structure locale de concertation. Et donc c'est une structure où euh, c'est là où se passe la concertation, c'est là où se passent tous les dialogues, une euh, force de proposition qu'on va proposer au niveau des, des bureaux exécutifs, au niveau des communes. Donc à partir de cette loi, la commune ne décide pas seule mais euh, la décision euh, émane de cette structure locale de concertation. Donc, euh, comme je vous ai dit, moi, je, je travaille donc au sein du FDL, qui est un instrument donc, euh, rattaché au ministère de la décentralisation, en charge d'appui de ces communes-là, d'abord financer les petits investissements, mais aussi assurer le renforcement des capacités des acteurs, notamment en matière de bonne gouvernance, la participation citoyenne et la, la, la transparence au niveau des gestions. Donc, l'exemple que je vais vous parler, c'est quels sont les processus euh, que nous faisons pour renforcer la communauté à prendre en main leur développement. Généralement, à Madagascar, les problèmes des communes restent encore au niveau des défaillances en matière des infrastructures socio-économiques telles que les écoles, les hôpitaux, les points d'eau, et ainsi de suite. Donc, les communes sont généralement euh, rencontrent des problèmes en matière d'insuffisance des ressources financières pour faire face à ces euh, problèmes-là. Donc les ressources seules des communes par le biais des impôts et taxes ne suffisent pas pour euh, répondre aux besoins de la communauté. Donc il faut que les communes d'abord travaillent avec les partenaires techniques et financiers pour les aider dans le financement, mais surtout, ça ce n'est pas euh, en permanence, mais il faut surtout qu'ils mobilisent les communautés à prendre en main leur développement. Donc nos approches consistent d'abord à travailler directement au niveau des communautés. Donc il faut d'abord sensibiliser les communautés à l'importance de sa participation à l'identification même des projets. Parce que si les projets qu'on va financer émanent des besoins réels de la population, on est sûr qu'il euh, va participer à, à la réalisation de, 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 cette, de ces infrastructures-là. Donc la première chose, c'est de mobiliser, sensibiliser la communauté à participer à l'identification même des projets jusqu'à sa mise en œuvre. Pour ce faire, nous avons euh, 
nous avons, mis, nous avons euh, regroupé chaque groupe socio-économique, chaque groupe socio-professionnel dans une association. Donc, il y a euh, un sous-forme de préfora. Donc, les, chaque groupe socio-professionnel existant dans la commune euh, euh, élit leurs représentants pour être membre de structures locales de concertation. Et c'est à ces représentants-là d'organiser des réunions, d'organiser des réunions de concertation pour identifier les besoins de chaque euh, entité, de chaque groupe socio-professionnel. Donc, les représentants de chaque groupe socio-professionnel identifient au préalable, au niveau de chaque groupe, quels sont leurs besoins en, en matière d'infrastructures et quelles seront leurs participations si ces infrastructures-là vont être réalisées par les communes. Donc, tout se passe déjà au niveau des bases. L'idée émane de base, les projets émanent de base et la capacité de contribution aussi émane de base. Ici, quand je parle de contribution, ça pourrait être en argent, en numéraire, mais c'est surtout la contribution de la population, c'est en nature. Par exemple, il amène des briques, parce que il y a des associations des, des fabricants des briques, il amène des, des, des produits locaux, comme les, les bois et les planches. Donc là, il détermine déjà à l'avance, à l'avance, qu'est-ce qu'ils vont euh, contribuer quand les infrastructures vont être réalisées. Après, donc, les représentants de chaque entité, de chaque groupe socio-professionnel qui sont dans la structure locale de concertation vont rencontrer les responsables au niveau des communes pour arrêter les projets à mettre en œuvre et pour arrêter aussi les contributions de chaque entité. Donc, en ce moment-là, les responsables au niveau des communes, les conseils communaux, ne fait que mettre ça dans la légalité en prenant la délibération pour valider ça. Mais toutes les idées viennent déjà de la communauté à partir des réunions de concertation qu'on avait organisées au niveau des communautés. Et puis... Quand les projets vont être euh, réalisés, c'est toujours ces représentants qui ont été élus au niveau des communautés qui vont mobiliser les communautés pour la collecte de leurs contributions. Parce que on sait, comme j'ai déjà dit tout à l'heure, que la commune n'a pas de, de ressources suffisantes pour le réaliser. Donc, les communautés vont participer parce que c'est eux qui ont choisi les projets. Donc, ils vont euh, participer à la réalisation des, des infrastructures. Et à partir de là, donc, les, les, les infrastructures vont être commencées, mais en même temps, les communautés amènent aussi leurs contributions. Et aux côtés de, de la commune, tous les principes de bonne gouvernance comme la redévabilité et la transparence vont être réalisées tout au long du, de la réalisation du projet. C'est-à-dire que les communes vont afficher la participation de chaque communauté. Les communes vont rendre compte l'avancement des travaux, les, la part des impôts qui ont été affectés dans la réalisation de ces projets. Et, et tout au long du projet, donc, il y a toujours ces... Euh, rédévabilité et de transparence dans la gestion de, euh, de la réalisation. Et donc, à partir de, de tout cela, on arrive à, une, euh, à la réalisation d'une infrastructure qui correspond aux besoins de la communauté, aux communautés et les services publics améliorés parce que tout vient de leur aspiration. Moi, je vais vous donner un exemple concret euh, au niveau d'une commune rurale qui n'est pas loin de capital Lantananarif. Euh, la commune, donc, a voulu euh, construire un lycée de quatre salles avec clôture 
et aussi sans table à bancs. Le montant total du, de cette construction s'élevait à environ 12 000, 12 000 euros. Le fonds de développement local, euh, l'organisme où je travaille, a donné 2 500 euros parce que à Madagascar, comme je vous ai dit, il y a plusieurs euh, communes. Donc la subvention de l'État ne peut pas couvrir tous les besoins de, de la commune. Donc la, le FDL n'a pas pu donner à cette commune que 2 500 euros après sa demande. Mais, comme je vous ai dit, le, le, la besoin de construire le, le lycée, ça vient vraiment de l'aspiration de la communauté. Donc, vous pouvez voir là que la communauté a pu euh, collecter environ 671 euros pour euh, compléter euh, cette somme. Et en nature, c'est-à-dire euh, en briques, euh, les sables, euh, les gravillons, les moellons, on a évalué jusqu'à 3600 euros la contribution de la communauté euh, par le biais de cette participation. Et les communes, la commune avec les impôts locaux a donné environ 5 000 euros. Et vous voyez que la participation même de la communauté euh, peut euh, être plus élevée que la participation de l'État dans la construction de ce lycée, car euh, la communauté a été renforcée euh, dès le début à l'identification et à la participation citoyenne. Pour conclure, euh, je peux dire que le renforcement, de la com... le renforcement de la communauté pour qu'elle prenne en main leur développement euh, est possible. D'abord, par un leadership fort de, de leurs représentants au sein de structures locales de concertation et par la participation et la responsabilisation de la communauté. C'est-à-dire que la communauté quand on leur donne les responsabilités, ils se sentent être fiers. Et dans tout ça, au niveau de la commune, il faut plus de transparence et de redevabilité à la gestion des affaires communales. Et il faut préciser aussi que la communauté sont très contente quand on valorise leur contribution en nature, mais pas seulement en argent. Donc, euh, voilà à peu près nos expériences et je vous remercie beaucoup. Merci, Richard. José Manuel. Well, good morning to all. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I don't have a presentation. I just, I'm going to talk 12 minutes, the time you gave me. Um, I'm a mayor uh, of a Portuguese town, municipality of about 100,000 people in Porto metropolitan area. Porto metropolitan area is about 2 million people, 1.9. So um, for our scale, Portuguese scale, my municipality is medium, medium size. Uh, my background, I was a member of uh, environmental movement and civic movement. But I grew up in a party. I, I have nothing against parties. We don't have democracies without parties, so just to know my background. Uh, the first time I ran to be mayor, I was 20-something. I lost. I had to wait 12 years. I ran again, and I was elected. Because I really wanted to be mayor of my town, you know. Because for me, politics, it's a power of changing of thinking, changing, of changing behaviors, of do things, you know, like the, the, the story of the, the Midas king, the one that touched, the king or, or queen. We never know if it was a queen or a king, because no, no, normally it's men that told the story. Probably it was the queen of Midas, not the king of Midas. But for me, politics is like that. It's the power we have to touch and to change and to do things and to start things and you know. So about democracy, since the beginning I had, I was for almost, uh, yeah, almost 20 years in the opposition. And it's good to be in the opposition for so long because 
if you are in the opposition, you, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy from, I'm, I'm center left, I'm a social democrat of the social party in Portugal. And uh, to be in the opposition a lot of time, if we want to learn when we are in opposition, we really learn. We learn what we, we should not do and what we must do. And one of the things I, I, I saw, me and the group of people, people from the party and independents, people from my movement, my, my environmental and civic movement, because that is part, of, that is very important to create a, when we create a, a project uh, to run a town or a municipality, we have to, to gather people from different sides, not only people from parties, you know, to create a big group of people, a great coalition. Uh, we, we, we know at that time, in, in 2013, we had this idea that we had problems with democracy at the local level. Uh, I, I, for, for us, it's, it's very good. A lot of people talk about democracy with good words, but, um, and, and a lot of people say they believe in democracy, but that's not enough. We, democracy is something like a garden. We must take it, we must take, take care of it every day. Not only with words, and, but especially with intelligent actions. Uh, and a lot of times what we see is passionate words, but no actions. <laughs> That's not enough. We need really actions. Because the problem of democracy is we have everyday weeds, weeds of every kind. And the weeds, the problem of weeds, it's they are around, all the way around, to mess the garden. That is the problem of democracy. When we started, we, um, we had this uh, strong idea that we know that uh, we have a municipality. It's a very good tool to do what? To inspire citizens, to invest in more empowered, enlightened people. Because if they are more empowered and if they are more enlightened, they can be more autonomous, more participative. And if they are more autonomous and participative, we create good pillars and they are very good allies of this endless job that is perfecting democracy. We will never have a perfect democracy. We, we have to say that. We, it is important. In my town, we work democracy. We use participatory democracy. We, we use all tools we can, but we are working about democracy. Sometimes people confuse, you know, they mess all. We are talking about democracy. Democracy is the word. When we talk participative and other things, it's a means to become, to, to have a, a strong democracy. And even if we don't have these kind of problems, uh, every, every town, every community has its own problems. We face problems real for us. We have high levels of civic ignorance in my community. Not in my community, only in, in my country, in Europe. Uh, the big majority of people, they don't understand. They don't participate. They don't understand. So they distrust. They distrust politicians. They distrust politics. They don't, work, they don't know the way government works. A lot of people here in Barcelona, they mean, like in my town, like everywhere, they don't understand how public money is, is, is uh, uh, used. And, but worse, they, they, they don't understand the way the municipality works. And that is the, the big picture we have all over the world, not only in poor countries, but also in rich countries. Uh, well, it's... Um, but it is a problem, the way public money is managed. Then we have, we, we feel it also, these kind of populist solutions. We have it also. Of course, Portugal, it's a case, a very special case. And it's a case that we have to study deeply because we have a socialist government with the support of the communists and the left bloc. It's the only case in Europe. And our levels of populism are very low. But we have, we have signs. Because populism, it always grows from democracy. Populism and fascism, it's uh, products of uh, bad democracy working. And so, 
Uh, and it is easy because, you know, populism in my country and other countries, it's the kind of low-cost politics, like a kind of fast food democratic options, very sexy in the beginning, you know, very easy solutions. And then comes the problems. Then we felt that we had also this kind of disappointment with democratic elected representatives for several reasons. It's, it's a lot of reasons, you know. When we talk with a citizen, and we have several reasons, never reach them, they are so far, they are always fighting each other, uh, growing visibility of corruption, this is a big pro very bro big problem for democracy, because it, uh, you know, it's a kind of, uh, it's, uh, um, but as a matter of fact, this is nothing new. The Greeks 2,500 years ago, they, they, they had a lot, of, a lot of things written about these. Greeks, they wrote about corruption, authoritarianism, demagoguery, populism. So it's nothing new. It's a kind of new fashion. Uh, of course, when we started in 2013, we know that uh, there is not a single recipe. And nowadays I can say it. There is not a single recipe. And whenever I heard someone says, I have the solution. Well, that's a demagogue. That's it. Okay, okay. That's a potential demagogue. Because there is not a single recipe, there is not a panacea or a silver bullet uh, that will fix all these modern democracy problems and will and bring back a vibrant engagement uh, democracy. No, it's not like that. What we do is uh, we are experimenting a lot of different things. And so, because we know that democracy is not a perfect political system. It is a very good system. And for me, uh, what I most value in democracy is it, it gives us freedom. If it's a real democracy, we will have freedom. And, uh, and with freedom, we can do a lot of things. We even can say no to a politician. We can change politicians. If we are not satisfied, that's one of the biggest power of democracy. So, and uh, what we, we try to do since the beginning, just to then explain what we are doing now, and, uh, actually, we, we, ha we, know, we, we knew since the beginning that uh, we had to give the example. Because in, the, in a democracy, in this system, the power of example, it is very important. It is very important, one of the most important things. Because a lot of times politician, politicians, they act as owners of public affairs and not as tenants. And it is different to be a owner or a tenant. It is completely different, like a house. Um, so, and we knew also we had to value civic plurality, plurality give more power to citizens. And to stimulate, you know, to stimulate more information, transparency, and put a, a strong bet on education. So, what we had, because we had this idea, listen, we are going to find whatever we can do using a lot of tools, because we know this dimension of democracy, participatory democracy, and representative democracy are twin sisters. We have to act knowing that they are like twin sisters they suffer with each other if a representative sister is bad it's good it's, bad. it's not good for the rep the, the, macro, the the participative democracy but if the democracy the participative democracy it's good maybe it helps her sister the representative democracy that's the way we are doing in volume so we started to do what we created a big problem a, a big project called uh, Reading costs nothing. We started, when we started running the, the municipality, we had about 3,000 people in our public libraries. Nowadays, in four years, we have more than 10,000. Because why? You cannot have a, a very strong democracy if people don't read, if people don't know, if people... People, a citizen that reads, it's something, someone that likes theater, that likes culture, that likes... It's, tend to be more tolerant, tends to, you know, to like information. So we had a very, it, it was one of the, 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 the first programs to invest in culture, theater, playing, you know, because of autonomy, uh, reading because of knowledge, 
to be, like I say a lot of times, to be pain on the ass. In democracy, you, ha you need to have citizens and they have to act sometimes like a pain on the ass for the politicians to create the very good dynamics, the very good dynamics. Democracy is debate. Democracy is conflict. It's fighting all the time. Democracy is that. Even when a lot of people don't say that, democracy without fighting, without discussion, you don't have that. Then we created a program we don't, we, at that time, we had financial problems because of the, the former uh, executive, the former government. They left a lot of uh, debts. So we don't have the opportunity to create a big PB pro process. We created a youth PB process. Nowadays, it's a, it's a big one. We have about 6,000 people voting, real, real people voting. And normally, we have more than 100 projects every year. And we are always inventing, you know, with the ideas of young people. It's from 6 to 36. But nowadays, it's funny because nowadays, th that guy is from 6 to 36. They can bring uh, senior people to their project. So nowadays, we are working with everybody. Fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers. So it's a PB, a youth PB. But in fact, it's a general PB. We don't spend a lot of money. We, the, the, the municipality, decided at that time, it's the municipality that executes the projects. So we have a 100% execution uh, uh, rate. All projects that are uh, voted, and they are executed. And you know, in a lot of towns, you have a growing number of projects that are not executed. That is very dangerous for PB, because it creates distrust. In our case, in our, with our model, we don't have that problem. We have 100% execution because we decide after, before voting, we analyze. It's very good for the people that work in the municipality because they have to go out of the box. They have to analyze. And it's very good because they, they dialogue with the people, young people, with people from the citizen, from the groups, from the movements. So, and it was... The, the other project, the second project, at the same time, like a multi-level appro multi approach. Then, in 2014, in the beginning of the year, I was elected in October, so we decided to invest in a 100%, our website, we have 100%, what we do, it's in the web. How much money we spend, it's in the web. What we have, what I have, it's in the web. If I have a house, we have everything in the web. Oh, it's almost, it's... Uh, it's whatever we do, it's in the web, like a lot of towns are doing. Why? Because it, is, it has two aspects, because sometimes it's used in the wrong way. But it's important because it is important to, to show people uh, the way money, public money is, is, uh, is executed, is, is uh, used. And uh, it, at the same time, every, everything we decide, it's there. So, there is no, nowadays, nobody can say, I don't know what's happening. No, no, if they want, they know, because everybody is in the web. In my town, 80% well, of the people are connected, so if they just, they don't know if they don't want. And a lot of times people don't want, so we, not, we cannot force them because we are not a totalist uh, regime. So we decided also with the numbers to challenge the university and there is a university created a program called Taclaro. It means like, it's easy. They use numbers to explain money, public money co comes from here, public money goes from there. It's like a tool to, you know, to, to teach. Then uh, um, we go every year to the, to the, the community uh, neighborhoods to explain, to explain numbers and to explain decisions and to hear from them. And um, then we organized during, the, in October, we have a, a week called European Democracy Week, local week, where we put everything we do from sports, environment, culture, health, everything. During that week, we call it the Democracy Week, because democracy is everything we do. 
we call the associations, the local movements, the local grassroots movements, and, and we dialogue, you know, in this idea, I think the time is running, so in this idea of, uh, you know, di dialogue every time, fighting, uh, disagreeing, uh, agreeing, and, um, and I, I think it's okay, it's 12 minutes, I, I'm, 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 if you want, you can ask me and I can give you more information. Thank you. Um, empezamos el, el turno de, de palabras. Um, yo casi no os veo por la luz. <laughs> eh, bueno, eh, quería agradeceros, la verdad muy interesante, eh, en concreto a la compañera de... Estados Unidos y el compañero de Madagascar me gustaría preguntar en vuestras experiencias eh, de empoderamiento comunitario a través de proyectos concretos o de cogestión o de, o de fortalecimiento de los recursos comunitarios ¿no? a nivel de las comunidades si, si esos mecanismos que la compañera decía ¿no? de exclusión ¿no? y de racismo a veces en las experiencias no nos centramos demasiado ¿no? en el fortalecer y no pensar en ¿no? esos mecanismos que excluyen ¿no? a, los, a, los, a ciertas partes de la comunidad. ¿no? Y entonces acabamos reproduciendo, eh, no sé si me, me explico, acabamos reproduciendo la, eh, las diferencias y las desigualdades y solamente fortaleci fortaleciendo a una parte de la comunidad. Um, so, yeah, I have an answer to that, and that was in that when I read about the mission of the project, it said ch we aren't taking a charity approach, an approach that nonprofit organizations would take, because those very much do um, reproduce and maintain structures of inequality. Um, I don't know if you've heard much about the idea of the nonprofit industrial complex whereby nonprofit organizations are funded by corporations with charitable contributions to basically put band-aids on the wounds that are created by those same corporations. So um, in this project, in the City Worker Cooperative Development Project, The very innovative thing we're doing here was the, um, the money that has been allocated for it, it's $600,000 a year for five years. Each year, half of that, $300,000, goes into a high-risk, forgivable loan fund that new businesses can, can borrow from. So businesses that are made up of formerly incarcerated people, undocumented workers, people who don't have access to the labor market and definitely don't have access to credit can access that pot of money to, to fund their businesses. The other half of that $300,000 a year goes for community organizing. So organizing the associations such as workers' rights centers, the um, Freedom Incorporated, which is a Black Lives Matter organization. Organizations that work on the front lines with these most affected communities. This money is going to build the capacity of those organizations to support the development of worker cooperative businesses. So there's the capacity building part and the cooperative um, ecosystem in our city is su supporting that um, with their own, our own resources in addition to the city money. So we, what we want to do is educate the people and organizations who are working with those most affected by um, these exclusion from the labor market to actually have that capacity to develop businesses. And then there's the actual capital component, which credit unions and our community development financial institutions are adding money to. So that's sort of an actual, the way city is, the city is actually releasing control of this project to the community 
um, because the city is, is not controlling the money. They're giving the money to these coalitions of community actors, co-ops, credit unions, uh, community organizations, and they're building the program themselves because they're closest to the people who have the needs. Más preguntas? Uh, good morning. Uh, well, I want to ask you, what do you think when it comes to engage people or to empower people to participate, which, uh, which competency or, or which skill is the most important? For example, do you think it's trustness, trustness in each other? Do you think it's accountability or transparency? Or do you think maybe we have to think about cultural and social civic background, first of all? What would you, what would you step in to, to empower, to engage people then, to, to start participating? For me? Yeah, it may, maybe for you, because you were, you were the one that uh, used more these kind of terms, but for each one as well. Well, can I ask? Well, as I told you, we have to, to uh, act with all segments of population, using all tools. It's very demanding, because what we are now, nowadays, there are some studies, as you know, probably, if you, if you do a search um, uh, or a research or, or, or search for research about participatory democracy like PBE, you don't have a lot of uh, quantitative and qualitative studies. And sometimes some writers are saying, some scholars, may, more scholars, they are writing that a lot of times they are finding that uh, uh, um, poor people and uh, not well educated or low education people participate less in, uh, in participatory democracy methods than uh, highly educated people. So that is a problem we have to solve. So when I ask, when I say we have to act in a multi-level uh, multi way, it is like that. We, we, you have to create or you have to use tools like PB, consultative uh, commissions, mini publics, you have a lot. It's, you just have to search, you have, you know, like a portfolio of uh, <laughs> several tools, and you have to use it to, um, to engage different, because you have really different, you know, people, societies are very complex. Some people, and I have to say, some percentage of, of our citizens, they really don't want. A lot of people don't want to participate. And I cannot force them. It is not democratic to force them. I just have to create this, the, this uh, ecosystem where, okay, if, if one day they need, they go there and I, they read the information. But you understand the, the, the idea? So to engage, it's very difficult. That is, some, sometimes that's the explanation why a lot of politicians or politicians, what is a politician? Citizen that have responsibilities. Like, for example, we are, in a way, we are politicians, mm -hmm. different kind. But me and, uh, and um, Rebecca. Rebecca are elected. I think you are not elected. Mm -hmm. uh, you are elected also? No, no. no. no, no. But we are politicians of, diff of different kinds. But uh, it is difficult it, because it's very demanding. You know, it's very demanding. And then if you have young people, you know, active people, uh, millennials, Generation X, Z, phew, it's incredible. Seniors, it is really difficult to manage all those... Uh, <laughs> So you have to be creative. It's easy if you have an idea, you decide. Like we decided, we want to empower people. We want autonomy, we want autonomous people, people that know what is autonomy. And it's, that is a very good word because then you have, it's easy to work, to be autonomy, autonomous, you know how to, you, you need to read and to write and to talk. It is important the theater because uh, dramatic expression helps you to be a very good citizen. And if you read, you can write a letter, you can write a project, you can defend an idea. So, you know, using different fields to, to, to create the, the proper environment to have better citizenship. I don't know if you understand the, this idea because it's not easy to explain. So I go back to the point I made about giving people um, decision-making power over things that matter to them. So 
say for example, here's something that matters to people, clean drinking water. Um, what if your drink, a well gets poisoned and your drinking water supply is finished or it, it, you can't drink it? People will come out to participate in decisions. If you open decisions around a water utility or how we manage our water, how we manage the budget of our water, they will come out because they really care. I don't know if anyone followed um, the Flint, Michigan crisis where just people were poisoned based on very bad decisions made by uh, water quality. Taxes, there's going to be a, a tax increase. Call them, people will show up for, for those meetings. They will decide. And so um, listening about participatory budgeting, for me that's an educational process. That's a process to help, start, to help people start to understand how to debate, how the city um, decisions matter to their lives. And when I went um, campaigned for election, I imagined the city as a giant cooperative and everyone in the city, and we don't, in, 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 in my city, we don't use the word citizens anymore just because of the immigration situation. And we use the word residents because citizen has a very specific meaning of people with a specific set of rights. So, but I imagine all of the residents in a democracy as you know, members with an equal say in, in this city cooperative, which includes the city budget. And there's a democratic process every year that we go through to pass the entire city budget, not just a few parts of it. Um, and so issues around police brutality, where the city funds the police, and our council, in its budgeting, um, we control the, the budget for the police. So activists who are organized against police brutality come to our budget hearings and argue for us to cut the budget of the police. So again, I think it's framing issues in a way that people understand that they, they matter to them. Like, and, and as a responsibility of politicians, we have to ask people th those questions constantly. What is important to you? What do you care about? What do you need? We have to always, always ask those questions and because the answers change as you know, conditions change. And then to open up participatory opportunities around those things that, that matter to people, I think, is, is where we'll have the most effect. And again, that socializes or educates people to um, understand the power they already have as people who live in, in a democracy. They already have that power, but they don't understand they have that power. So I think we as leaders as conveners, as people who mobilize people, we need to let people understand understand that. Bueno, yo de bueno de las de las tres experiencias que habéis que habéis expuesto he recogido como dos ideas fuerza que creo que que bueno que se han ido repitiendo, ¿no? Sobre todo para hablar todo el tiempo todo el tema de reforzar la comunidad, ¿no? Eh, la primera sería eh, la idea esta de democratizar el poder, ¿no? Y que bueno, que me ha gustado mucho también la, la cuando cuando José Manuel, por ejemplo, pues ha explicado el, eh, la idea esta de, de que somos, de que so, bueno, de que sois en este caso los que eh, ostentáis cargo político, eh, unos arrendatarios, ¿no? Del poder no, no los tenéis, en, no tenéis en propiedad, ¿no? Es una, una figura que me ha parecido muy interesante. Eh, y al, al, al partir de esta idea de, de democratizar el poder, hay dos ideas que se relacionan, que también habéis eh, ido repitiendo ¿no? eh, desde mi punto de vista. Una que es el, el, la necesidad esta de extender el conocimiento, la educación, ¿no? para poder eh, empoderar ¿no? a esta ciudadanía. ¿no? Y bueno, la idea que tú comentabas ahora también, ¿no? que haya más que ciudadanos, ¿no? también residentes, o hasta la, la idea esta que me ha parecido muy interesante eh, del papel de las cooperativas. ¿no? Y esto lo, lo enlazo con el otro, el, el otro punto que, que me 
parece que también va saliendo, que es el, la gestión de lo, de lo económico, ¿no? la gestión del dinero público ¿no? que comentábamos. Y aquí vosotros bueno, pues habéis presentado experiencias que creo que son muy interesantes, ¿no? desde la, la, la gestión de, desde la cooperativa, ¿no? que creo que es, es, es un, un contrapunto y, y, y que a veces eh, desde la participación nos olvidamos un poco del tema económico y creo que es muy interesante. Y, y luego todo el papel de, bueno, aquí le llamamos más presupuestos participativos, pero Richard, eh, la línea que ha explicado de los proyectos eh, en los que eh, la, los ciudadanos de la comunidad ¿no? eh, también eh, participan en el desarrollo de estos proyectos ¿no? y hasta, si no lo he entendido mal, también financian parte de, del, del, del proyecto. ¿no? Se, son, son ideas eh, interesantes a la hora de fortalecer la, la comunidad, porque sí que creo que, eh, aparte de, de lo que es la participación ciudadana, como la entendemos de participar en estos eh, mecanismos de participación y de procesos de participación, eh, la parte económica nos da una fuerza muy interesante y muy potente y que a veces la tenemos un poco olvidada y que a veces a, lo, a, a los mismos eh, gobernantes les da un poco de, de, de pudor ¿no? el hecho de que la ciudad pueda eh, implicarse directamente en cómo gestionar este dinero público, en cómo gestionarlo en los proyectos, ¿no? Hay un poco de, de recelo. Eso es lo que me ha sugerido aquí. <risa> Thank you. I had a last question for um, Jose Manuel. Um, la, can you tell us what uh, one of the really concrete example in your city of, part, of participative project with OBP, for example? With, with the PB, the youth PB? Uh, one a concrete participative project in Valor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have, for example, nowadays we, we have uh, 150,000 euros, we have a maximum of 10,000, it's a youth project. Because in the beginning, we, when we started with this project, we found out that the question is not the amount of money. It was a, it was a good finding at that time, because sometimes there is the idea, if you have a participatory budget, you need millions. It's not true. The question is the process. For a, young, for a young guy, a young boy, a, a, you know, a guy, a young boy, 10,000 euros, it's a, a mountain of money. <laughs> and the, 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 the impact in, in its brain is completely different from an, an adult. For a mayor, 10,000 euros, it's money, but you, you say, oh, I cannot do a, a big thing with that. But for a young boy, 10,000, it's a, a mountain of money. After five years of projects, we have, listen, we have, Several uh, rooms of the future. Uh, <laughs> I inaugurated last uh, last month because I, we go with the, the, the young boys, with everybody, to you know to open. We have things like public spaces with uh, machines to do uh, uh, exercise. Uh, 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 kindergarten. What's, what's the English name? You know those small parks for inclusive for Grounds. for and yeah, but. Adapted, adapted uh, playgrounds uh, within schools, outside schools. We have a, a very good program concerning a disease called uh, Alzheimer's disease. So you know, it's the creativity of community working. We have, after five years, we have about twenty something projects in the field and three hundred ideas. A lot of times, some of, of the ideas that are not voted, uh, that, are, that, that don't win, we use it. <laughs> because we, we decide, let, let's do this. You know? For example, a consequence of the PB, the youth PB, we have about 30 schools in the first cycle. In Portugal, we have three cycles, the, oblig the uh, mandatory school. And the, the local municipality has the first cycle. And we have 30, three zero uh, schools, first cycle schools. And when we saw the first time the, the room, these uh, laboratory rooms that are uh, 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 creating everywhere, we decided, the municipality, with that idea, to create 30 more, investing 1 million euros. So it's a kind of effect. You have a tool, and then you have a consequence. 
with 10,000, <laughs> it created the decision of investing 100 million, oh, oh, sorry, 1 million in 30 different laboratories, future laboratories to learn with the computers, with the robots, with uh, a lot of things, you know, that uh, it's uh, happening. So we have a lot of examples, I can tell you. It's, uh, bueno, mira, me informan de que tenemos que ya cerrar la mesa. Eh, muchas gracias a todos vosotros por haber venido y a vosotras por haber participado.